from conservation biologists all, all over the world that uh, really conveyed to, to many people in politics and in the political debates on environment around the world the importance of, of something that we missed, the areas without roads. You can start the first presentation, please. So, the global roadless areas that we are going to see uh, after the, my short presentation. We have uh, NGOs like Amazonia uh, in here in Brazil and all over the world that are fighting exactly for the protection of roadless areas in each and every part of our beautiful planet. Okay. So I'd like to share with you some thoughts that come from 1855. It's uh, Chief Seattle. It's a phrase that I guess you already read when you were a child or later on, humankind has not woven the web of life. We are but one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together. All things connect. For me, this phrase is essential for, because in one phrase, we have the three reasons why we should protect roadless areas. We have the environment, protecting the web that sustains life. We have the indigenous people that live in these roadless areas very often, and very often they don't want these roadless areas, to, roadless areas to change. They don't want the way of living to change. And of course, we do have uh, the economic benefits that derive from protection of roadless areas, and the protection of ecosystem services they provide are beyond uh, only the sequestration of carbon, but the, the management of the water cycle, the prevention of floods, the protection from uh, spreading of disease, and many, many others. So what is a roadless area? A roadless area is an area that has not roads, but it doesn't mean that it does not, the, the points in, within, within it, are not connected by other ways. Roadless areas may have trains. Roadless areas may have ports and riverways. Roadless areas may even have airports, small airports, local airports. What is the difference between trains, uh, the railways, and the ports, and even these very small airports, is that once, once you have a a road, once, let's say, we have a road, anyone can take uh, with the legal manners a bulldozer and open another one, or it can be the initial, they can be incentives to expand this network, and thus, then the, what, I, what I call the spider net of roads expands. And man-made man pressure towards these areas expands. If we were to protect an area that has a road, it's much more complicated to build the, the institutional framework. In order that this protection is established, it would be much costly, much more costly to put all the manpower which is necessary to guard this institutional framework of protection. So if we want to protect an area, if we have identified that for, uh, for environmental reasons this an area should be protected, or that for, uh, because exactly that of the local population, the right to manage their, their land, and we should not go and make uh, a project there, keeping a, an area roadless secures both the human rights and the, in, in the environment, and uh, the ecosystem service and the economy, economic benefits that derive from that. So here we can see the Amazon, and we can see how this spider net of roads, 
expands into the forest. This increases illegal logging and poaching, threatening the indigenous property rights, and that often leads to tribal extinction. You, I'm sure you've heard the stories of uh, people in the, in the Peruvian Amazon, tribes that have been found accidentally when uh, miners moved into the forest, opening their open roads and moving into the forest for mining, mining concessions, and then getting in touch with uh, tribal people that uh, get them uh, affected by the, uh, by the disease that, that did not encounter. Very similar story than what had happened back in the 1500s, and thus uh, this tribe being extinct. extinct. We know the story of uh, the Serengeti National Park, Tanzania. There again, uh, there was a big fight in order that a road snot crossed the Serengeti National Park. This very well established and internationally known, known national park. The arguments that were heard and the road was stopped was that this road will lead to habitat fragmentation, soil erosion, which will help the spreading of animal diseases and loss of endangered species will disrupt the animal movement and migration that will lead to invasive species being uh, spread and uh, environmental contamination take place. Economic, economic reasons like the decline in tourism is such a well-known uh, wildlife tourist destination. And of course, what is, what is very important for environment in Africa, a high probability of illegal forcing and law. Again, a recent story from Bolivia. You all know the Tiffany's Reserve and how uh, there was a big demonstration against the road being, being built in Bolivia. Three uh, tribes live within this reserve. Uh, they want to stay roadless. They, want, they don't want this big infrastructure to cross their, their own habitat and the national habitat. And it was this, uh, these reasons that they conveyed to the government that stopped this road. Here you can see in, uh, in uh, the Amazon areas of well, risk for deforestation, and I'm sure that Mr. Marianne will present uh, similar uh, pictures. And here you can see the roads that have been expanded. If you see, it's where they are, the roads are. That, that is the risk for deforestation. So we talk about the social benefits that include respecting the decisions of uh, indigenous people living this, in these areas. If the indigenous people want a road, nobody can say no. But if they don't, we should be respecting their, their, their own rights. Social benefits will include, of course, what the ecosystem services provide, how they these roadless areas provide also for, for a barrier, barrier for the spread of human diseases and so on. The environmental benefits, uh, I don't believe I should stay much on this topic, it's very clear, the protection of the ecosystem services, what uh, exactly was said before that, that consists the web but on which we depend, our lives depend. Some very recently, we had a very big success internationally. In uh, Nagoya, we managed to have an agreement for certain targets for the protection of global biodiversity. Not only percentage of our uh, of our terrestrial soils, our areas, but also marine areas, but also certain goals that we will commonly achieve. And I hope that where we are now in this meeting, the Rio Plus 20, we will be able to have as a great success as we had in, uh, in Nagoya. You know the strategic goals, I will stick only to the strategic goal C, to improve the status of biodiversity by safeguarding your systems, species, and genetic diversity. 
that and all the other four targets are clearly met by and help to be met by keeping areas we want to protect from us. Economic benefits again beyond tourism, it's all these economic benefits from the ecosystem services, these unique places to provide. And uh, I would like to share a quote from a very important person from Greece. It's Nikos Kazantzakis, you know him from uh, Zorbas, but he wrote uh, many other amazing books. And he says that it's, it's mine and mine alone the duty to save Earth. If Earth is not safe, it's my fault. So that's why we have this gathering of forces here to do this duty, to perform this duty, because we have a choice to open roads or not to open. And uh, we need to discuss globally this choice. We need that we globally make roadless, keeping areas roadless, and uh, an option for policymakers, and sometimes even obligation. Thank you very much.